Good morning, everybody. So in the last lecture, we showed some examples about um, the Druder model for metals. And what I would like to do today is um, I would like to give you additional examples for the Druder model and for the Lorentz model. And um, as a reminder, uh, we write the dielectric function as a sum of really three contributions. Uh, the, the one that is the contribution to the dielectric function that comes from the vacuum. And then we have this last term here, which is a sum of Lorentzians. So the charges in the material can oscillate under the influence of an electric field, an electromagnetic field, and they have this resonance frequency omega zero. So <coughs> the, this Lorentzian term assumes that the restoring force, the frictional force, is proportional to the velocity. So that is the main assumption in the Lorentz model that the, res I'm sorry, that the uh, frictional force is proportional to the velocity and that allows us to have this constant damping term in the denominator. Now that is a very simple assumption which is, uh, very diff uh, which is not always fulfilled and therefore there's a lot of talk about a frequency dependent damping term or other types of uh, mechanisms to introduce different forms of damping and that basically has to do with, you know, what is the relationship between the frictional force and the velocity. And then uh, the second term, uh, free charges, uh, I should say bound charges, have a resonance frequency, which is related to the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. But of course, free charges in a metal, uh, they are free, they do not have a restoring force, and therefore the resonance frequency uh, for free charges is zero, which gives us this uh, Drude term. And um, in the infrared spectral region, the um, oscillations of charges are um, related to the oscillations of uh, the uh, atoms, the ions in a solid. And so because, of the, because the mass is very large, uh, we are getting uh, relatively low um, resonance frequencies and therefore um, atomic vibrations or um, lattice vibrations give us peaks in the infrared. In the visible the, uh, or in the UV, the absorption peaks are due to oscillations of electrons which have a much smaller mass. And then of course there is the Drude term which is related to uh, free carrier oscillations. We applied uh, the Drude model to a variety of metals and we looked at them in, in some detail at uh, different types of metals. And then uh, we switched to semiconductors. Uh, there are four semiconductors here, four elemental semiconductors here in the fourth column of the periodic table. But we can also form three, five semiconductors like gallium in the third column and uh, arsenic in the fourth, in the fifth column. So that would be a three, five semiconductor. Or we can look at two, six materials like zinc and oxygen. So zinc oxide is a common uh, two, six semiconductor or cadmium and tellurium. Cadmium telluride is another common uh, two, six semiconductor. Um, if we look at gallium arsenide and we have uh, then the uh, gallium uh, has a th it contributes three electrons and the arsenic contributes uh, five electrons. So together uh, they have four electrons, which is what a semiconductor needs to have. But by adding impurities, we can either have too many or not enough electrons, so we can have more than four electrons per atom or less than four electrons per atom. And that is known as doping. And this is shown here for uh, indium antimonide. Uh, remember, indium is here and antimony is here. So for example, if we add 
tellurium, so if you have indium and tiamonite, and then we add maybe one part per million of tellurium, then um, tellurium adds an extra electron, so that would be a doping mechanism for indium and tiamonite. Uh, then if we plot the reflectivity versus wavelength for indium and tiamonite with uh, some sort of electron dopant, then we see that at very long wavelengths in the far infrared, the reflectivity is very close to one, and then it drops, and we have this minimum here, and this minimum is uh, very close to the plasma frequency, and the plasma frequency is the density of the electrons uh, divided by the effective mass. Uh, a, the mass of an electron in a solid is different from the mass of the electron in vacuum, and this is something that we will get to later, uh, but therefore we have this uh, effective mass in the denominator. So using infrared spectroscopy, it is possible to uh, determine the uh, carrier density and the effective mass and the scattering rate of uh, doped semiconductors. So we can treat doped semiconductors as if they were metals. Um, one can do this, and this is, has historically been done uh, using um, infrared reflectance. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people use uh, infrared ellipsometry, and I had a slide in the last uh, lecture uh, with a comparison of the uh, infrared reflectance and <coughs> infrared ellipsometry. So now, I, so on the previous slide, we looked at some reflectance spectra. Now I will show you some infrared ellipsometry spectra. And when we plot infrared reflect, uh, when we plot infrared ellipsometry data, we have these ellipsometric angles, psi and delta which I introduced probably in the second or third lecture. Uh, you see uh, you, uh, the ellipsometric angle psi, that has some similar shape as the reflectance in, uh, in, in infrared reflectance. So we see that the, uh, if the angle psi is 45 degrees, then usually the reflectance is one. And um, this sample here is uh, n-type indium arsenide. So uh, we have indium here and arsenic here. So that's uh, very similar to indium and timonite. And we see that there are two bands where psi is 45 degrees or uh, reflectance is one. So we have this uh, first band here. Uh, and the, the reflectance is one, and then it drops, and then the reflectance goes up again, and it stays close to one, and then it drops again. So the first uh, band of high reflectance, uh, that is due to the free carriers, so that's the Druder absorption, and then the second band uh, the, is due to the transverse and longitudinal optical absorption, which we describe with a Lorentz model that I will get to later. So this is indium and timonite. Uh, I'm sorry, this is indium arsenite. And um, uh, from this first band, we get two parameters. We get, the, uh, we get a plasma frequency and we get a scattering rate. And what we, but we don't really want to know the we don't really want to know the uh, plasma frequency. We really want to know the carrier density. So in order to uh, find the carrier density, we need to know what the um, effective mass is. So then, uh, once we uh, assume the effective mass, or once we're able to determine the effective mass, uh, then we can calculate the uh, carrier density, which is you know six times ten to the sixteen. It's it's not very large. Uh, it's not very large, but the effective mass is very small, and that's why we see a very nice um, uh, band of high reflection from the uh, plasma frequency. Uh, we also get a scattering rate, which is 50 wave numbers, and that gives us a mobility, which is uh, 6800. And the people, the, the electrical engineers typically specify uh, 
mobility as if uh, in units of centimeters squared per volt seconds, not meters squared. And similarly, the carrier density is usually specified in units of uh, inverse uh, cubic centimeters. Um, how do we get the mass? And I will show you a little bit about that later. One way to get the mass is that one does the same experiment as here. One does infrared ellipsometry in a magnetic field. So then, uh, because of the cyclotron effect, the Lorentz force, uh, one is able to determine the, um, the effective mass. So for indium arsenide, that works very well. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, gallium and chimonite, it does not work very well at all. And uh, so let's look at, again, so this is indium arsenide and indium and chimonite and gallium and chimonite. So all of these materials should be very, very similar. But for uh, gallium and chimonite, we get an effective mass of 0.13. Uh, indium arsenide and gallium and chimonite have approximately the same band gap. And therefore, as I will show you in, in a future lecture, because these two materials have about the same band gap, maybe 0.4 EV for indium arsenide and 0.6 EV for gallium and timonite, uh, because the uh, band gap is very similar, the effective mass should also be very similar. But here we're getting this strange value of 0.13, which is five times larger than for indium arsenide. So why is that? Uh, and I think I will get to that later. Um, another example is uh, gallium arsenide. And here we are showing gallium arsenide uh, both undoped or with very low doping and um, uh, with high doping. So for the highly doped, <coughs> excuse me, for the highly doped uh, gallium arsenide, we see that the uh, band of high reflectance extends further into the infrared. Uh, this band is much wider for the doped gallium arsenide and for the undoped gallium arsenide, this band of high reflectance is very narrow. But in addition to the uh, width of that first band, what we also see is that the longitudinal optical frequency is pushed towards higher energies by the doping. So in the undoped case, the TOLO Reststrahlen band is very narrow, but it is much wider uh, in the doping. And that comes from the fact that these free carrier oscillations are longitudinal oscillations. And therefore, the free carrier oscillations uh, can interact with longitudinal optical vibrations. And therefore, the LO frequency gets pushed uh, to higher uh, to higher energy. This is known as a plasmon that the doping pushes the LO phonon to higher energies. And from time to time I will show you a picture and then that's usually the student in my group that uh, did this work. So, uh, so it works for indium arsenide. This, this Drude theory works well for indium arsenide. It works also for uh, doped and undoped gallium arsenide. It doesn't work for the gallium and timonite. And uh, in order to study that in more detail, uh, we, are, we put these samples in a magnetic field and these measurements were done in Matthias Schubert's lab at the University of Nebraska. And um, if you apply a magnetic field, then the electrons that get accelerated by the electromagnetic field uh, from the light wave, uh, they also experience a Lorentz force in the magnetic field, which drives the electrons into a cyclotron orbit. And that allows us to determine the uh, effective mass. And here for indium arsenide and um, so this optical Hall effect, this optical Hall effect data, uh, we need to look at certain elements of the Mueller matrix. And uh, remember that I showed you the Mueller matrix that we described polarized light uh, with the Stokes vector. And then um, the Mueller matrix describes how these uh, Stokes vectors of the reflected light change uh, relative to the incident light. Uh, 
So we're getting these uh, uh, data, and so these are uh, elements in the off-diagonal blocks of the Müller matrix. So we're getting these peaks here, and if we fit that with a model, uh, and if the magnetic field is known, the magnitude of the magnetic field is known, then uh, we are able to determine the uh, effective mass uh, because now we have a magnetic field. Uh, for gallium and timonite, uh, the fit is not so good and we're still working on that, but most of all the uh, effective mass is completely wrong. And why is that? So in order to understand why the effective mass of uh, indium and timonite is uh, so different, uh, uh, why we cannot measure that correctly, we need to look at the uh, band structure of gallium and timonite uh, if you ever want to know the band structure of the materials, uh, the band structure of a material, uh, the best place that I found, uh, the Joffe Institute in uh, St. Petersburg has an outstanding uh, database, free database with all kinds of parameters about semiconductors. So this picture here is taken from the um, Joffe Institute website. And if we look at the, con so uh, this is the uh, Fermi level for uh, this semiconductor, gallium and timonite, and then we have uh, three whole bands. Uh, this is a P state, so we have three bands, and this P state is split into a J equals one half and a J equals three half state. That's the one half state, that's the three half state. Um, and the J equal one half state, that's the split off band, and the J equals three half state uh, consists of the heavy holes and light holes. And uh, heavy and light here in this case uh, refers to the curvature of the bands. So that we can understand from the uh, P-type uh, valence band structure. Now, um, the excited states have uh, potential energy and kinetic energy. Uh, K equals zero, uh, the kinetic energy goes like K squared over 2M, or H bar squared K squared over 2M. So the uh, kinetic energy is often the lowest, but not always. The kinetic energy is, always, uh, is often the lowest for the uh, K equals zero. So the sum of potential and kinetic energy in the excited state, that is the lowest state. Uh, and gamma, that's simply a group theoretical way of saying that the uh, wave vector k is equal to zero. So the gamma valley has the lowest uh, energy in the excited band, in the conduction band. But there are two other minima. There's one. Uh, there's two other minima at the boundaries of the Brillouin zone. There is this L valley and the X valley. And for gallium and timonite, the separation between the gamma valley and the X valley is only, where do I have the number? Um, 80 milli electron volts. So remember, KT at room temperature is 26 electron volts. So the separation between the gamma valley and the L valley is less than, uh, is only about three times the, uh, is only about three times KT. Um, the effective mass in the gamma valley is 0.041. And um, this L valley is anisotropic. <clears throat> there is a perpendicular mass uh, going in and out of the uh, plane of that slide, which is 0.11. And then there is a longitudinal mass, which is in the plane of that slide, which is 0.95. So what we do is we take uh, this mass uh, in, in two directions and this mass. And of these three masses, we take the geometric mean, that's the cube root of the long of the uh, transverse mass times the parallel mass squared. So uh, we take the geometric mean of these three masses and then we have to consider that this L valley is at the boundary of the Brillouin zone. So we have four of these valleys and then we're getting a density of states mass at the L valley, which is 0.57. So we have the ground state, 
uh, with a mass of uh, 0.041, but just three times kT above that, we have an L valley with a more than 10 times larger effective mass. And now you need to do thermodynamics and you need to calculate how likely is it that an, that an electron is not in the gamma valley but instead in the L valley. So uh, my student Farzin did that calculation. It's, it's straightforward. You just need to use some Fermi integrals and Fermi statistics. And it turns out that 70% of the electrons are here in the gamma valley and 30% of the electrons are in the L valley at room temperature. So when we do transport in gallium antimonide, the transport is not just governed by the electrons in the, L, in the gamma valley, we also need to look into the electrons at the L valley. So what we see is there's a much smaller number of uh, electrons that actually contribute to the transport and one third of the electrons have a large effective mass. So, yes. Yes, so so the, 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 com the question is about the temperature dependence of this effective mass. At room temperature, we find 30% 30 30 of the electrons here, but at low temperatures, uh, we should uh, find all of the electrons here at the gamma valley. Yes, and um, I just submitted a proposal to do that experiment. <laughs> And unfortunately, it was rejected, so I need to resubmit. Uh, but uh, obviously, yes, uh, that's exactly what one would want to do. And I will bring you some even crazier examples that we also want to do with this. Um, so we measured an effective mass of 0 0.13, which is much larger than the 0 0.041. However, the reason we're getting an effective mass which is larger than the gamma valley mass is because some electrons will be in the L valley. So the 0 0.13 mass that we had for gallium antimonide is actually some sort of an average uh, of these two masses and uh, we're doing calculations to figure out uh, how, uh, uh, how we can quantify that. So sometimes uh, and, and Drude already knew that in the 1890s uh, sometimes uh, one species of electrons is not sufficient in order to describe the free carrier response in a material. Sometimes we need more than one species of carriers, like in this case electrons at the gamma valley or the, and the L valley. And another complication is that one of these valleys is, is anisotropic. So there are examples when uh, multiple Drude contributions are necessary and I showed you one here with, uh, uh, with these, with, with these uh, different conduction band valleys. But of course we also have uh, different hole bands. We have a light hole band, a heavy hole band and a split hole band. So in a P-type semiconductor we may also need multiple uh, uh, Drude contributions. So if, uh, um, the, in, in a semiconductor we have these different uh, valleys, we have an X valley and a gamma valley and, and an L valley and the X valley and the L valley are at the boundaries of the uh, Brillouin zone. So in this picture uh, we're looking at different types of uh, Fermi surfaces for uh, N-type semiconductors. So gallium arsenide is rather straightforward because in gallium arsenide, uh, this L valley here is 300 milli electron volts above gamma and it's because it's 300 milli EV, that's 10 times KT, we don't have to worry about uh, electrons in the L valley at room temperature. And therefore, if we draw the Fermi surface for N-type gallium arsenide, uh, we're getting this sphere which is located at the center of the 
uh, Brillouin zone. On the other hand, and, and I took this picture from an electrical engineering book, and obviously that's not the right picture for the uh, Brillouin zone, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, but if we look at silicon, then in silicon the um, uh, conduction band minima are along the uh, delta direction, are along 1, 0, 0. So in silicon we have these six uh, ellipsoidal um, constant energy surfaces. And in uh, germanium we would have them along the 1, 1, 1 surface. Uh, the kinetic energy is given as h bar squared k squared over 2m. So if we want to know, if we want to define the effective mass, then we need to take the second derivative of the energy with respect to k, and that gives us 1 over m plus some factors. So if we take this derivative for an anisotropic valley, then instead of getting the mass as a number, we are getting a, an effective mass tensor. And uh, for this particular situation, um, where we have one longitudinal mass and two transverse masses in this uh, effective mass tensor, the Drude mass then is equal to the harmonic mean of uh, these three masses. So we can still apply the Drude model for such an anisotropic system. I'm sorry, uh, uh, the, the valleys are anisotropic, but silicon as a material is still cubic. And because silicon as a material is still cubic, the dielectric function is still described by a, uh, by a number, by a, by a function, not by a tensor. However, the mass which enters here in the uh, plasma frequency, that comes from, a, from an anisotropic valley, and therefore we need to uh, take the uh, harmonic mean of the three masses in order to uh, describe uh, this uh, semiconductor with the uh, Drude model. So, um, gallium arsenide is very simple, just a plain mass. Silicon, we have to take into account the uh, uh, effective mass tensor. Um, tin is a very interesting material because it is a topological insulator or because it, is a, uh, it can be a Dirac semi-metal. And um, in tin, uh, if we look at tin, then um, the, the L valley is uh, at approximately the same energy as the gamma valley. Remember gallium and timonite, the separation between uh, L and gamma was on the order of uh, 80 milli electron volts. In tin, well, there's one paper which, there's only one paper which, act, which uh, tries to quantify this difference, and they say that this difference is about 5 milli electron volts. So in this case, uh, L is almost degenerate with gamma, and now it would be even more interesting to do that room temperature experiment, to do that temperature dependent experiment. Um, so now we need to consider uh, three bands that contribute to the Drude term. We have this. Uh, these uh, four L valleys, we have this uh, light hole band uh, and the uh, heavy hole band. Um, and the light hole really here is an electron band. So we have this electron band here, which is shown in green, and the uh, heavy hole band, which is in red. The uh, band gap for alpha tin is exactly zero because this state here is the J equals three half state uh, in alpha tin. This is the J equal one half state, and that is the uh, S antibonding band. And I showed you the band structure of tin uh, some time ago. So for gallium and timonite, we need to consider uh, transporting two bands for gallium and timonite. Uh, I'm sorry, for alpha tin, we need to consider uh, three carrier species. Uh, this one here, uh, anisotropic. So, this is alpha tin under uh, 
uh, in the bulk without any strain. Uh, the problem with alpha tin is that um, alpha tin is the gray tin, that's the cubic tin. It converts into gray tin, which is hexagonal at 13 degrees Celsius. So it is very difficult to do experiments with uh, alpha tin because you constantly need, you need to grow it, you need to produce the material below room temperature, and you need to do your experiments with it uh, below room temperature. Um, uh, that's very hard, uh, but if you grow alpha tin as an epitaxial layer on, some, on a cubic substrate, uh, with a thickness of, say, 1,000 angstroms, then the cubic substrate uh, stabilizes the alpha tin, and that means that you can do experiments uh, with alpha tin at room temperature. So, for example, um, a common substrate on which to grow alpha tin epitaxially is indium antimonide, and cadmium telluride is another substrate uh, that has been used. So, you grow alpha tin on indium antimonide. But then, because the lattice constant is not exactly uh, equal, uh, the lattice constant of alpha tin is not exactly equal to that of indium and timonite, uh, the band structure, uh, this alpha tin is under strain, and therefore we need to include the strain in our uh, calculations. So we see this uh, 12 milli electron volt split between the, uh, of so there's a 12 milli EV splitting of the uh, J equals 3 half state, and then this is the direction of the bands um, perpendicular to the strain, and this is the direction of the bands uh, parallel to the strain. And you see here that these bands are crossing, and this is a linear crossing, so this is the same type of Dirac point uh, that you find in graphene. And here at this Dirac point, uh, because the K is equal to, uh, uh, this is a linear crossing, so the energy is linear in K. Let's go back to the definition of the effective mass. So the effective mass is related to the second derivative uh, of the energy versus K. So the uh, energy now is linear in K rather than quadratic in K, and therefore, uh, the mass here is zero. So this electron here at the Dirac point is a massless particle, just like a photon. And now it really will be interesting to do this uh, experiment and to study the Drude model uh, because uh, we, um, we should be able to pick up this uh, Dirac point in... Um, in infrared uh, spectroscopy. Uh, we can also, do in, so this strain here, alpha tin on indium and timonite is tensile. Uh, we can also add a little bit of germanium to the tin, in this case 6% germanium is added uh, to, uh, then we can form uh, tin germanium alloys. So by tuning the composition between the germanium and the tin, we can tune the lattice constant and then we can go from this tensile strain case where we have a Dirac point to this uh, compressively strained case where we have an indirect gap. Uh, and um, this Dirac, I'm sorry, this true deformulism can be very complicated if we consider uh, realistic band structures. Um, the analyzing the Druder response in infrared spectra is relatively new. Uh, but before that, uh, people studied uh, uh, the Shubnikov de Haas effect and they studied um, oscillations of certain spectra in a magnetic field. And this, uh, if you refer to chapter 12 in Ashcraft and Merman, then uh, the velocity is, the, uh, uh, is, is h bar k over m, so the velocity is p over m, so the velocity of an electron is the first derivative uh, 
uh, with respect to k, and then semi-classically we can write that uh, we can write Newton's law h bar uh, h times k uh, k dot. Uh, so uh, k is the momentum and the derivative of k, that's the acceleration. So this is the ma term in Newton's second law, and these are the forces that act on the electron. We have an electric field, and uh, so this is the Coulomb force, and this is the Lorentz force velocity uh, uh, cross product times b. And then the third ingredient that we always need to consider is uh, the... Uh, the distribution of the electrons, uh, which is given by this uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution, and we've seen the importance of including that uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution in gallium antimonide because we have two different bands and the electrons can be in different bands. So for this type of an experiment in a magnetic field, the mass that is really relevant is the cyclotron mass. And in a magnetic field, the electrons will go in circles. And we do, in our first year physics classes, we have this E over M experiment where an electron is in uh, crossed uh, electric and magnetic fields, and then the, 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 the electron goes in a circle, and from the radius of that circle, uh, the students determine the E over M ratio. But if the band structure is uh, complicated, then uh, the, the orbits are more complicated. So if this is the Fermi surface, and that's a picture taken out of Kittel, then uh, you know, we can have one orbit which goes around this big thing, or we can have an, a, a, another orbit which goes around this uh, little... Uh, uh, which can, uh, which, uh, the electron can uh, have, the electron can go around circles with uh, uh, different kinds of radii. So in this case, the cyclotron mass has to do with the area of these uh, equipotential uh, surfaces. And this area can either be large or this area can be small. So we can see different types of uh, masses depending on the direction of the magnetic field, uh, and, and this can be very complicated. And to the best of my knowledge, these uh, shubnikov de Haas oscillations, uh, uh, or Shubnikov, uh, yes, these shubnikov de Haas oscillations, they're typically performed with electrical measurements, and then you get this uh, electrical type of uh, signature, but it would be interesting to do those also uh, with optical measurements because I think uh, that, that, that one should see uh, such effects. And um, this cyclotron mass can be uh, simplified and there is a new book out by Dresselhaus that I have mentioned where this cyclotron mass has to do with the determinant of this um, effective mass tensor and here uh, in the denominator, this B is a uh, this B is a unit vector which points along the direction of the magnetic field, and we need to do this uh, uh, product with the uh, effective mass tensor. So, if you have a very simple system where you only need one Drude term and you have uh, spherical valleys. If you have only one of these terms, then uh, it's very simple to apply the uh, Drude model, but I wanted to show you that there are plenty of complications that you can run into with a Drude model if you consider more realistic uh, band structures. So I realized that the last few slides were uh, probably a bit intense, but I've tr done my best to give you uh, uh, references to the various books where you can find more detail about this. Uh, so the way that people uh, have mapped out these uh, oscillations and uh, is, has been using cyclotron resonance. And cyclotron resonance means that you measure the microwave absorption as a function of the magnetic field. 
And um, if you measure the uh, absorbed power versus uh, magnetic field, then you get these peaks. And uh, whenever the, uh, you get these peaks, whenever the frequency of the microwave that you apply, in this case 24 gigahertz, so whenever the uh, cyclotron frequency equals the uh, 24 gigahertz, then you get a, um, an absorption peak. And because you have different uh, types of, because you have different types of carriers in your material, you have electrons in holes with different types of masses, uh, you get multiple peaks and then using um, by, uh, by placed by uh, changing the direction of the magnetic field uh, relative to the sample uh, you can map out the um, effective mass tensor with the components in the various directions and the famous paper here that needs to be mentioned is Dresselhaus, Kipp and Kittel, so that goes back to 1955. And um, by, doing, by performing uh, microwave absorption measurements in a magnetic field with different directions, uh, so here we are plotting the effective mass as a function of the direction of the magnetic field, it is possible to extract the longitudinal mass and, I'm sorry, I think this has to be the, tra this is the transverse mass. It is possible to map out the transverse mass and the uh, longitudinal mass uh, for germanium or for other semiconductors. So if you ask, if you, if you wonder why, how do we know uh, the values of the uh, elements in this effective mass tensor, that was done uh, using cyclotron resonance. This was done uh, for n-type uh, silicon and germanium. Uh, we can also do that for holes, and if we do it for the holes, then we have to take into account that uh, these bands here are, uh, are warped. So that means that the effective mass for the light hole, and especially for the heavy hole mass, they determine the direction. So that's all been... Uh, determined using cyclotron resonance. Okay, so that was uh, the Drude part. And uh, now I want to switch and show you examples for the uh, applications of the Lorentz model. And so now we're switching from metals to semiconductors to insulators. So what is an insulator? Uh, first of all, an insulator has a uh, forbidden zone. An insulator has a band gap between the occupied states and the empty states. So this is the Fermi level. The dashed line here is the Fermi level. The states below the Fermi level are filled. That we call the valence band. And the states above the Fermi level, that's the conduction band. And between the, between the empty states and the filled states, there is this band gap. If the minimum of the conduction band has the same K value as the maximum of the valence band, then we call that a direct semiconductor or a direct insulator. But if the minimum of the uh, conduction band is in a different, has a different value of the uh, K vector than the maximum of the valence band, in this case we call that an indirect uh, semiconductor. So direct semiconductor, indirect semiconductor. Um, a direct transition is, a trans is an optical transition where we take an electron from the maximum of the valence band and we put it into the, the conduction band uh, at a, in a state which has the same wave vector. So this is a direct transition. If the initial state and the final state have different K values, we call that an indirect transition. So something that often confuses people is that if a material is indirect, like germanium, yeah, this could be germanium, or this could be silicon. So silicon is obviously an indirect material, 
But even in silicon, I can have direct transitions. In germanium, I can have direct transitions because there will always be states that I can go to without changing the k-vector. Similarly, if I have a direct semiconductor, where the, then if I have a direct semiconductor, then this band would be higher. Let's go back to gallium and timonite. Yes. So here, this is a direct transition, and gallium and timonite is a direct semiconductor because the lowest state in the conduction band is directly above the valence band. But even in gallium and timonite, I can have indirect transitions. So I can have direct transitions even in an indirect uh, semiconductor. Um, when do I call it a semiconductor and when do I call it an insulator? Uh, that's really a matter of semantics. Um, Typically, people would say that if the band gap is in the infrared, then we call it a semiconductor, and if the uh, band gap is in the visible or uh, UV spectral region, then we call it an insulator. So an insulator and a semiconductor are really the same. Uh, it's uh, are qualitatively the same. There's only a quantitative difference uh, semiconductors or insulators with a small band gap. And now the question is, how do you define small? Uh, it's, it's really hard. Good. So now let's move to insulators. So in insulators, we see a variety of uh, absorption peaks. We see absorption peaks in the infrared. We see absorption peaks in the visible. And we see absorption peaks in the ultraviolet and X-ray regime. In the infrared, the absorption peaks are due to uh, oscillations of atoms, lattice vibrations. In the visible, the absorption peaks are due to electronic excitations, interband transitions. And then in the ultraviolet and X-ray regime, uh, we can also see uh, additional peaks, additional absorption peaks due to transitions from core electrons. And the amplitude of these peaks depends on how many oscillators do we have. So that has to do with the charge density. And the amplitude of these absorption peaks also depends on matrix elements uh, that relate this transition. Uh, the Born effective charge is the uh, charge in the, uh, is the charge of the bond, and the larger this charge of the bond is, the, 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 the more, uh, the larger the amplitude of a um, lattice, uh, of a lattice vibration. So we see these absorption peaks, and we see those in the imaginary part of the dielectric function, and then the real part is chromoschronic consistent, so uh, we see a series of these uh, derivative-like structures. And what you also see is that um, the refractive index, or the real part of the dielectric function, as the frequency goes to infinity, uh, the uh, dielectric function becomes equal to 1 because the charges because the frequency becomes so high that the charges can no longer follow the uh, frequency of the um, applied uh, electromagnetic field. So at, at high frequencies, epsilon is equal to 1. And then if we go to lower and lower frequencies, then more and more charges uh, have a sufficiently small mass in order to follow the vibration. So this uh, epsilon becomes larger as we go towards lower frequencies. Uh, so that was a very schematic scheme. So now let's look at an example. So this is SiO2, silicon dioxide. And in silicon dioxide, we see various peaks in the infrared that come from various uh, stretching and bending modes of the silicon oxygen bonds. Uh, SiO2 is an insulator with a band gap of uh, maybe around 8 electron volts or something like that. So the extinction coefficient is zero over a broad range of the visible and UV spectrum. 
And then in the UV, we see a very rapid increase of the extinction coefficient due to interband transitions. And then the extinction coefficient drops off towards the X-ray regime, but once in a while we see these uh, edges or steps, and uh, those have to do with excitations that come from the core electrons. Uh, in, the visible, in the visible spectral region, the refractive index of silicon dioxide is relatively linear and uh, it is sometimes necessary to describe the dispersion of, a, of an insulator, to describe the dispersion of the refractive index of an insulator uh, in the transparent region. And uh, one way to do this is that we can set the broadening equal to zero so then this expression is the Lorentz expression with gamma equal to zero, then we can call that a pole. So this pole, we can rewrite this expression as a function of the wavelength rather than frequency. And then uh, epsilon as a function of lambda uh, uh, takes this form. And in, typically we need more than one of these um, absorption terms so we can write the refractive we can write the dielectric function as a function of lambda as one plus a sum of these uh, uh, Lorentz oscillator terms so the Lorentz oscillator with zero gamma and written as a function of wavelength rather than uh, uh, frequency uh, that is known as the Selmayr approximation and that was developed uh, in Munich uh, in the second half of the uh, uh, 19th century uh, when people wanted to uh, make uh, precise um, uh, glass lenses and wanted to correct for uh, chromatic aberrations. So using this Selmayr equation it is possible to describe the uh, refractive index of glass as a function of frequency. That's a picture here taken from Fox. And um, you see that there is a point here where the second derivative of the refractive index is zero because we're crossing in this regime uh, the infrared uh, absorption, the, the lattice vibrations in SiO2 are the important contribution. And then here we're going up to this um, uh, we're going up to the absorption of SiO2 in the uh, ultraviolet. So because of this, uh, this increase of the refractive index with frequency, that is called dispersion. In this case, normal dispersion because the refractive index increases as the frequency increases. And be with this uh, dispersion, we can model the uh, dispersion of uh, light uh, as it goes through a prism. So this is the uh, Selmayr expression and another expression which is uh, common to describe the dial uh, to describe the refractive index of an insulator is the Cauchy equation. So now here we're writing uh, the refractive index as an inverse power series with uh, even uh, exponents. And you can view this as a different type of series expansion of the uh, Selmayr equation. So this Cauchy equation does, uh, does not include absorption and therefore this is not Kramer's chronic consistent. And sometimes people include uh, the absorption uh, at the uh, edge with an Erbach tail uh, with this exponential type of term. But now if we, look at the, uh, if we look at the real part of the refractive index with the Cauchy equation and the uh, extinction coefficient with an Erbach tail, uh, this is certainly not a Kramer's chronic consistent. 
And therefore, I really do not recommend that anyone should use this uh, Cauchy uh, Erbach uh, model, even though you know it's simple, it has a small number of parameters, but the physics is just so wrong that uh, you don't know what conclusions to draw uh, from such an expansion. So instead of the uh, Cauchy equation with an Erbach tail, uh, it is much more common and much more physical to use a tauts lorentz model instead. Uh, and uh, maybe I will show you some examples for that later, but uh, I, I don't have any examples here today. So uh, there are a variety of uh, models to describe the dispersion of insulators. So now I want to switch gears and um, maybe take another half hour or so uh, to talk about the uh, lattice vibration, the, the infrared absorption from lattice absorption, from lattice vibrations. So if we look at a material, say germanium, then uh, we start with the lattice and the lattice uh, is a, a cubic diamond lattice and from the lattice we're going to a brillouine zone uh, as we have discussed and um, every k vector in this brillouine zone describes a normal mode of the germanium crystal vibration so the the normal modes of that crystal can be classified by points in the um, brillouine zone and then um, we have uh, two atoms in the primitive cell, so that gives us six degrees of freedom. So we have six different uh, vibrations, and um, we are plotting these six uh, vibrations as a function of the uh, wave vector in the Brillouin zone. And um, along certain uh, low symmetry directions, uh, this is the 110 direction, we can actually count one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, phonon modes. Um, along directions with higher symmetry, we only have four. You see, here we only have four um, modes because. Two modes are the, the two transverse modes, uh, the two transverse acoustic and two transverse optic modes are uh, degenerate along this uh, one zero zero direction. If the two atoms of the unit cell move in phase, we call that an acoustic phonon. And if the two atoms in the unit cell move out of phase, we call that an optic phonon. So there is an acoustic branch where the atoms move in phase and there is an optical branch where the atoms move out of phase. So that's why we have three acoustic phonons and three optical phonons. Of course, the definition of acoustic and optical only really makes sense uh, for very long wavelengths. But nevertheless, we call them an acoustic and an optical branch. And we have to worry about the typical uh, group theory uh, degeneracies here at the X point by symmetry of the space group. All, electro, uh, all states need to be at least doubly degenerate. And at the gamma point, all states need to be uh, triply degenerate. Um, In this case, the dots are actually data points. So how would one measure uh, the frequencies of the six vibrations uh, for each point in the Brillouin zone? And the most common method to do this is using inelastic neutron scattering. And with neutron scattering, uh, we, have, we need a crystal which is cut along uh, a certain direction and then the neutrons can penetrate uh, the germanium rather easily and then we measure the direction and the energy of the inelastically scattered neutron uh, 
another way to do this is using uh, X-ray scattering. But with optics, uh, because, the, uh, wave vector, because the wavelength of the uh, photon is a thousand times larger than the separation between atoms in the germanium crystal, uh, the wave vector of the photon is zero within the uh, dimensions of the Brillouin zone. So therefore, with photons, we can only study uh, what happens at the gamma point. So here, uh, the gamma point means k is equal to zero. So the frequency of the acoustic mode at k equals zero is zero. So that's very hard to see. So the only thing that we can study with light is um, of, uh, lattice vibrations with very, very long uh, wavelengths. Um, if we do an infrared transmission experiment in germanium, then we see that it does not absorb at all. There is no lattice absorption in germanium because uh, the uh, chemical bonding in germanium is uh, covalent and therefore there is no charge transfer between the two identical germanium atoms and therefore we do not see any uh, infrared absorption in germanium. However, if we go to a polar material where there is a uh, partially ionic bond, that means some charge has been transferred uh, between the two atoms then we see that there is this uh, divergence in the real part of the uh, dielectric function. There is an absorption peak uh, at the resonance frequency and then there is a divergence. And then here at the, uh, so the refractive index or the real part of the um, dielectric constant, it first goes up slowly and then it diverges for zero broadening and it comes back from minus infinity and then it goes through zero and then it continues. So the resonance frequency is a transverse mode and remember that when the um, dielectric constant is equal to zero then longitudinal uh, oscillations are possible. So the transverse mode gives us a peak in the absorption and a divergence in the real part of the dielectric constant. And then the longitudinal mode, that's the mode where the uh, real part of the dielectric constant goes to zero. So we have this region here shown by the dashed lines where the a uh, real part of the dielectric constant is, equ uh, is, is negative. And here, as I will show you on the next slide, I think, uh, as I will show you on the next slide, if the real part of the uh, dielectric constant is zero, then the reflectivity must be equal to one. So in an insulator, we have this band where the reflectance is one, and this band extends between the two dashed lines so the, the, the rise, the beginning of this band is the TO frequency and the end of this band is the longitudinal optical frequency. So that was the theory. We should have this band. And here are uh, actual examples taken from Fox. So this is indium arsenide and gallium arsenide and the reflectivity goes up, does not quite reach one uh, and, and then we have this plateau and then the reflectivity drops. So that's the T of frequency and that's the L of frequency and this band of high reflectivity that is called the Reststrahlen band. And um, uh, where this band is located in frequency that of course depends on the um, reduced mass of the two atoms in the lattice. Uh, these data are, uh, were acquired with reflectivity. If we use ellipsometry, then we can directly measure the dielectric uh, constant. Uh, we do not need to do any type of modeling. <coughs> 
and gallium phosphide, I'm choosing gallium phosphide as a material because the mass is relatively small, so the uh, resonance frequency is uh, rather large at around uh, 350 wave numbers. So this is the ellipsometric angle psi, which is plotted as a function of wave number for different angles of incidence. And what we see here is, let's take 65 degree angle of incidence. Um, the psi starts at a rather low value and then it gets close to 45 degrees at the TO frequency, which is shown by the, dashed, by the dotted line. And then the psi stays at 45 degrees and then it drops again. And you see the actual drop is a little bit higher than the LO frequency. So graphically, it is not possible to read the LO frequency from these data, but uh, one needs to model the dielectric function uh, using uh, this Lorenzian oscillator. And um, here in gallium phosphide, the model works uh, really, really well. So this is the... Um, ellipsometric angle psi, this is the ellipsometric angle delta. And um, here for delta, we see that uh, for, for an insulator, for a transparent material, the ellipsometric angle delta must be either zero or 180 degrees. If the delta is uh, not zero or 180 degrees, then there is some sort of absorption. And whether the, uh, the angle delta is zero or whether it is 180 degrees depends on whether the angle of incidence is smaller or larger than the uh, Brewster angle. So for... Um, for 45 degrees which, and for 60 degrees, which is shown by the red and uh, black curves, the angle of incidence is less than the Brewster angle and therefore delta is equal to 180 degrees. But then if we go to, a, uh, if we go to an 80 degree angle of incidence, now here the angle of incidence phi is larger than the Brewster angle and therefore uh, delta is uh, equal to zero at the lowest uh, frequencies. And then here in the restaurant band between the TO and LO frequency, we see this transition. And then again, at uh, very large uh, frequencies, delta is either zero or 180 degrees, depending on whether the angle of incidence is smaller or larger than the Brewster angle. So we can explain these uh, res uh, responses of uh, psi and delta uh, very well uh, with the Lorentz model. Um, these data were taken on an instrument which is identical to the IR ellipsometer, which is uh, here at this institute. Uh, but these data were taken in... Uh, at New Mexico State, but the same data could be taken on the instrument that is here. So from the uh, ellipsometric angles psi and delta, we can calculate without modeling the dielectric function. And what we see here is an absorption peak uh, shown by the red line and this derivative-like structure for the real part, which is shown by the um, uh, by the black dots and by the black line. And we see that at low frequencies, we get the static dielectric constant, which is 15.7. And at the higher frequencies, we get this uh, high frequency dielectric constant, uh, which is nine. So as stated before, the static dielectric constant is always larger than the uh, high frequency dielectric constant. There is a little bit of a deviation between the uh, model and the data um, just below the um, TO oscillator. And uh, typically one uh, describes that with a little bit of disorder in the lattice, which gives us an asymmetric uh, peak shape. Um, so the TO frequencies are peaks in the dielectric function. 
If I take the inverse of the dielectric function, then that will peak wherever the, lo wherever the longitudinal frequency is located. Remember, this was the shape of the Lorentzian oscillator, and the Lorentzian function, that goes to zero at the LO frequency. So if I plot one over epsilon, then I get a divergence at the LO frequency. So I'm plotting the real part of minus one over epsilon, and then I'm getting this uh, peak at the LO frequency rather than at the TO frequency. So this function minus one over epsilon, that is known as the loss function, and uh, that shows us where longitudinal vibrations are located. Here I'm showing you the um, imaginary part of the dielectric function for a variety of different materials. Indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, and gallium arsenide are all, and gallium phosphide are all a cubic zinc blend semiconductors. And the uh, vibrational frequencies of these, uh, the vibrational frequencies of the TO mode in these cubic uh, zinc blend semiconductors, they are determined by the reduced mass. So gallium phosphide is rather light, and therefore it has a high TO frequency. Indium arsenide and gallium antimonide have rather heavy atoms, and therefore their vibrational frequencies are much lower. I've also mixed into other materials lithium fluoride and nickel oxide. And uh, these two materials are also cubic, but they um, crystallize in a different cubic structure. And of course, lithium fluoride, while it may have a similar reduced mass to gallium arsenide, lithium fluoride is much more ionic than gallium arsenide. So in lithium fluoride, the splitting between the TO frequency, which is here, and the LO frequency, which is there, this splitting is huge because the Born effective charge is huge. In nickel oxide, we also see a rather large splitting between the TO and uh, LO frequency because nickel oxide uh, is also more ionic than gallium phosphide. So the ionicity of the bond determines the width of the rest strahlen band, the, the separation between TO and LO, that's determined by the ion ionicity. And where the resonance frequency is, that is determined by the reduced mass. Um, we've seen here that uh, from, uh, from a fit to the, uh, from a fit to the um, ellipsometric spectra in the infrared for gallium phosphide, we can determine the TO and LO frequencies and also the low frequency and the high frequency dielectric constant. So this, these are four numbers, TO and LO frequencies and low frequency and high frequency dielectric constants. Here are those four numbers, TO and LO frequency, and static and high frequency dielectric constant. These four numbers are related by the, through the Lorentz model. These four numbers are determined by a fit to the Lorentz model. These four numbers uh, are uh, related by this equation and this equation is called the LST relation uh, after Lydane, Sachs and Teller. And um, this equation can be derived simply by setting uh, epsilon equal to zero in the Lorentz model, uh, ignoring the damping. Uh, so we can do that here. This is the Lorentz model. Um, at zero frequency, we define the static dielectric constant. So the static dielectric constant is equal to epsilon infinity plus A. So by doing a fit with a Lorentz model uh, written in this uh, form, 
uh, we can determine the contribution of each Lorentzian to the static dielectric constant. And then we define the ELO frequency by setting epsilon of ELO equal to zero, because you remember longitudinal modes require that epsilon must be zero. So then zero is equal to the Lorentz expression evaluated at the ELO frequency. And this equation is equivalent to the uh, LST relation. So uh, there is a relationship between the transverse and longitudinal uh, vibrational frequencies and the static and the high frequency dielectric constant. So if we have more than one uh, phonon mode, if we have a more complicated crystal structure, then uh, rather than having just one factor of uh, uh, the longitudinal over the transverse frequency squared, uh, we need to take into account that we have multiple modes so the ratio of the static over the high frequency dielectric constant uh, becomes equal to a product. And the first time I've seen this was in this uh, Japanese paper. And uh, then there are some crystals which are anisotropic, which have very, very complicated uh, dielectric functions. And in this case, this expression needs to be generalized and instead of taking, uh, uh, because now in anisotropic crystals, the static and uh, dielectric constants are no longer constants, but they are tensors, which can have uh, up to uh, eight, uh, up to uh, six different uh, elements. So now, instead of using these numbers, we have to replace the uh, uh, we have to replace here these numbers with the determinant of the tensors for the static and high frequency dielectric tensor. Uh, this was a FISREF letter in 2016, uh, which was a long time after that uh, LST paper that came out in uh, 1941. So you see that uh, you know, this is a very active uh, research area. Uh, now, these expressions are really only valued, uh, are really only valid for crystals uh, where we can, where we have clearly described, um, where we have clearly defined dispersion relations for the vibrations in crystals. But there is also a, a generalization uh, by Sievers and uh, Page, which can be used for amorphous materials and liquids. So there's also a uh, lydane sachs teller relation for amorphous materials, where you have to calculate some sort of moment of all the longitudinal and uh, transverse uh, frequencies. Uh, Al Sievers was a, or is a, uh, a highly uh, respected um, infrared spectroscopist at Cornell University and he's had a, a number of students like uh, Dennis Drew at Maryland and uh, Dave Tanner at Florida uh, who have been uh, very, uh, have become very famous in their own right. And um, John Page uh, was at Arizona State and uh, I learned group theory from John Page uh, at Arizona State. So, gallium phosphide was very straightforward and could be described with a simple uh, Lorentz model. Uh, but nickel oxide uh, looks very similar. It looks, you know, we have this one uh, Lorentzian peak and the uh, derivative-like uh, line shape in the real part. Uh, but uh, you know, you've noticed that I've, I have this black box here. There's something behind this black box that we also need to try to explain. Uh, so the Lorentz model does not work so well for nickel oxide. So what's the difference between nickel oxide and, and lithium fluoride? Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so the nickel oxide has this rock salt structure, but nickel oxide is also an antiferromagnet. And um, we have the, there, there's this magnetic ordering along the 111 direction, and because of that, there is a very small uh, distortion, a very small orthorhombic distortion of the nickel oxide crystal structure. Uh, so when we look at the Reststrahlen band, then we, we clearly see there's something wrong because we should see an increase of the uh, reflectivity at the TO frequency and then it should stay constant and then there should be another drop in the uh, reflectivity at the LO frequency. But here we have one drop first and then there's a terrace and then there's another drop. Uh, there's another drop. And if we look carefully, very carefully at the uh, absorption coefficient and we multiply uh, the, this here by 20, then we see, yes, there is another peak. And um, at first I thought that this peak was due to the uh, ferromagnetic uh, ordering in nickel oxide. Uh, but unfortunately, as Humlicek points out, we see the same peak in lithium fluoride, which is clearly not uh, antiferromagnetic. And we also see the same type of terrace. So this peak is actually not coming from the antiferromagnetic ordering, but this peak is coming from uh, two phonon absorption. And... Uh, in order to explain two phonon absorption, we need to go back to uh, the dispersion relation, and here, not for nickel oxide, but for diamond. So we have, in, in diamond, we have three acoustic modes and three optical modes. And um, at the zone boundary, we have uh, a variety of different uh, frequencies. And if we look at the um, first order infrared absorption spectra, the, the strong infrared absorption spectra for diamond, well, we don't really see anything at the optical frequency because uh, diamond is completely covalent. And therefore, this uh, absorption at the uh, optical frequency in diamond is forbidden. But we do see absorption peaks that are sums and differences of uh, vibrational frequencies at the zone boundary. So here is um, uh, the absorption coefficient plotted as a function of uh, energy. So as an example, the TA phonon has a frequency of 105 milliEV and the uh, longitudinal mode has a frequency of 139, so we add these two together, we get 244 milliEV, and indeed there is a peak in the uh, infrared absorption at 244 milliEV. So rather than having one photon creating one phonon with the same zero wave vector, one photon can create two phonons, one at plus x and one at minus x. And then uh, we are able to conserve momentum in this transition because the, uh, transition, because the, uh, the, the two phonons have opposite wave vectors. So if we add these two wave vectors together, we still get zero. So one phonon, I'm sorry, one photon with, with a zero wave vector is able to create two phonons and usually because the, uh, usually at the boundary of the Brillouin zone because that's where the density of states is higher. So um, we see that in uh, diamond and that has been studied uh, uh, in detail in the 50s and 60s and here is another example for uh, gallium phosphide uh, where we see a variety of these uh, peaks, uh, two phonon absorption peaks in gallium phosphide, you know, there's a whole zoo of them. And then um, it is possible to calculate what these spectra should look like uh, 
based on uh, lattice dynamical models that were fitted to neutron scattering data. And we see that, you know, there's, there's, we find similar peaks between the uh, uh, optical spectra and the uh, theory for two phonon absorption. So uh, this peak here in uh, nickel oxide is a, a two phonon absorption. Um, and uh, Homlicek points out that within such a Reststrahlen band, we are very sensitive to weak absorption from other modes. So here we have the TO mode and the LO mode, and something in, in somewhere in between is this weak two phonon absorption. So there, uh, because of that weak absorption that occurs in the Reststrahlen band, we see this dip in the uh, reflectivity or in the uh, ellipsometric angle psi. If we have more than two atoms per unit cell, then we have multiple modes. So if we look at strontium titanate as a perovskite, then in strontium titanate we have five atoms and five atoms give us uh, 15 degrees of freedom, but three of those are acoustic phonons, they're translations, so we're really only getting 12 degrees of freedom. But because of the cubic symmetry, they are all threefold degenerates, so we are getting four phonons at gamma. And now we need to use group theory to decompose these four optical phonons into uh, the various uh, representations. And we find that there are three phonon modes with gamma 1,5 symmetry. These are infrared active. And one phonon mode with gamma 2,5 symmetry, and that is silent. And that can only be, that cannot be, so a silent mode cannot be seen with Raman or with infrared a spectroscopy, so the only, the best way to see this is with um, hyper-Raman scattering. So we have three different uh, gamma 1,5 modes, gamma 1,5,1, gamma 1,5,2, gamma 1,5,3, and um, with this instrument that is here at the uh, Institute, uh, we can only measure to about 250 wave numbers, so there's this second mode, and for the second mode, we can only see the uh, TO, uh, we can only see the LO frequency, that's where the psi drops. And then for the third mode, we can see the onset, which is the transverse mode, and the drop, which is the LO mode. And instead of showing this as uh, psi and delta, we can also look at peaks in the dielectric function. So we see that third TO mode very well. And in the loss function, we see the second LO mode and the third LO mode. Uh, if we wanted to see the first uh, TO LO mode, the first vibration, then we would need an instrument that can measure uh, lower than 250 wave numbers which is possible, and there's, there's a number of instruments that can do that, for example, at, uh, uh, in Brno. Um, all modes, all, um, all modes for strontium titanate are shown here in this figure as a function of temperature, so let's count one, two, three, four, five uh, different modes. And uh, what's plotted here is the dependence of the frequency of these vibrations as a function of temperature. So as you cool down, as you cool down a crystal, it normally becomes harder. So as you cool down a crystal, the spring constant becomes larger, the crystal becomes harder, and therefore as we cool down a crystal, the frequency increases. So that's called a hardening of the phonon as you cool down the crystal. And you can see there's one, two, three modes where the uh, frequency increases. So there's three hard phonons in uh, sonium titanate. But there's also three modes, 
where the uh, frequency drops as you cool down the crystal. So that is uh, considered an anomalous behavior. So a softening of the phonons means that as you cool down the crystal, the frequency decreases. And for one mode, as you cool down the crystal, uh, the frequency of that mode goes to zero at low temperatures. And the, uh, such a soft phonon which goes, which goes to zero, where the, uh, if the frequency goes to zero, then the, um, uh, the amplitudes of the vibrations become very, very large. And such soft phonons uh, drive a, a phase transition uh, because atoms are, are um, moving collectively. And if we look at strontium titanate, uh, why is there a phase transition? Well, there is a phase transition between, uh, there is a phase transition from a normal phase at room temperature to a ferroelectric phase. But unfortunately, that the, the uh, Curie temperature for that ferroelectric uh, transition uh, is below a zero Kelvin. So that's why it's called an incipient ferroelectric. It never actually becomes ferroelectric, but it would like to become ferroelectric. It just runs out of uh, space. Uh, so here the uh, uh, mode, the frequency of this mode here uh, drops to uh, zero. So uh, if the... Um, resonance frequency goes to zero and we look at the LST relation, the, the frequency of the TO mode goes to zero at the Cura temperature. So if that is zero, then in order for that uh, product here to remain finite, that means that the static uh, dielectric constant uh, must go to infinity. So such a uh, soft phonon where the resonance frequency goes to zero uh, gives us a, a transition to a ferroelectric uh, structure. Um, so strontium titanate had five atoms but it was still cubic and, and not too complicated but uh, we can go to more and more complicated systems uh, lanthium, lanthanum aluminate is a distorted uh, perovskite which uh, no longer has cubic symmetry but it has this uh, hexagonal symmetry and uh, spinel is a cubic structure but it has, a, uh, it has many many atoms in the um, primitive cubic cell and um, like I showed you I think it was in the second lecture uh, we can use group theory to uh, classify all the phonons by breaking up this representation here into irreducible representations. And that allows us to find the Raman active modes, which are shown in green, and the infrared active modes, which are shown in red. And that allows us to interpret uh, infrared ellipsometry spectra for uh, different types of crystals, like in this case, uh, lanthanum aluminate and uh, magnesium aluminate or spinel. And whenever we plot the uh, dielectric function, the imaginary part of the dielectric function, we find peaks which give us the transverse frequencies. And if we plot the loss function, then we get peaks that uh, show us the longitudinal vibrations. Um, LSAT is another example. Uh, LSAT is, an, uh, is, a, distor is a disordered uh, alloyed uh, double perovskite. So this is the perovskite cell. If I put another perovskite on top of it with a different atom in the middle, then that would be a double perovskite. So this strontium-2, aluminum, tantalum, oxygen-6 that's, a, that's a, a double perovskite where in the first perovskite we have aluminum and in the second uh, uh, perovskite cell we would have tantalum and then uh, we repeat this 
But in, in this case, uh, LSAT is an, an alloy where this double perovskite is mixed with a lanthanum aluminate. So we have 70% uh, of this double perovskite and 30% of this lanthanum aluminate. And uh, for such complicated crystals, we have many, many phonon modes and uh, several rest strahlen bands. And we not only have a larger number of modes because of the uh, double perovskite, but also the disorder introduces a variety of, of other peaks. And uh, this was work that we uh, published a few years ago for LSAT. And you will see that um, in the spectra, we can go down to around 50 uh, wave numbers. So there are ellipsometers that can measure uh, down to 50 wave numbers. I've already mentioned the one which is in Brno in uh, Josef Humnicek's lab. Uh, this, these measurements were done by uh, Premisel Marsik, uh, who is in uh, Christian Bernhardt's group in Fribourg in Switzerland. Uh, so it is possible to measure at uh, lower frequencies if there are phonons uh, which have a, a resonance frequency which is lower than the one that can be measured on the instrument that is here in this facility. So the commercial instruments only go down to about 250, but uh, some people have built their own instruments that can go to lower frequencies. Um, the examples that I've shown so far were all for um, bulk crystals. Uh, but of course, it is also possible to study thin films. Uh, this material here is a cobalt 304. So this is a cobalt spinel on a, a magnes magnesium aluminate spinel substrate. This is a transmission electron uh, micrograph, which shows a very nice interface between the substrate and the uh, epilayer on top. Uh, the thickness of this uh, cobalt layer is 22 nanometers. And if we look at the ellipsometric spectrum, this here is the ellipsometric angle psi. Then primarily this spectrum is the same as for the bulk spinel. But here you see this Reststrahlen band. So I want to reiterate something that I've said before. If you have a Reststrahlen band, then within that Reststrahlen band, you're very sensitive to small absorption peaks from something else. And in this case, the, uh, one of the, uh, the dominant phonon mode of uh, cobalt uh, oxide, the, its dominant phonon frequency, uh, sits right here in this Reststrahlen band, and therefore you can see this very sharp uh, dip within the Reststrahlen band of the substrate. So this arrow here points to the vibration from the uh, um, epitaxial layer. So even though this cobalt sp uh, oxide spinel layer is only 22 nanometers thin, it gives us a very pronounced uh, structure that we can clearly uh, identify and fit. And then uh, some of the other phonons are harder to see, like, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, this is another phonon, and, then, and this is one, and then we have another one at, at higher frequencies. So other structures are more subtle. But even for such a thin layer, using ellipsometry, we are able to uh, determine the lattice dynamics of such layers. And uh, so that is all that I wanted to say about the applications of the Lorentz model to lattice dynamics. So I have maybe another five minutes uh, where I wanted to talk about the analytical properties of the dielectric function. And this uh, uh, goes back, this, this is more uh, theory material. Um, I've already shown you the kramers kronig relations. Um, the causality of the response function requires that the response function must be negative in the lower half of the complex plane. 
and therefore we can uh, use contour integrals to derive a relationship between the real and the imaginary part of the dielectric function. So if we know the imaginary part of epsilon everywhere, we can immediately calculate the real part and vice versa. And that is simply an application of uh, the Cauchy theorem for complex integrals to the causality of the um, linear response function which describes the polarization of a material. So that I've already shown you, but there are other analytical properties of the dielectric function. So the first one is that the electric fields are always real quantities and therefore if we uh, change the sign of the wave vector and the frequency inside as arguments of the dielectric function, if we, if we go to negative frequencies, uh, negative temporal and negative spatial frequencies, then uh, that must be equal to the complex conjugate because if we add a complex number with its complex conjugate then the imaginary parts cancel out and therefore uh, we're getting a real quantity. And in, now if we set k equal to zero then that means that the dielectric constant at negative frequencies must be equal to the uh, complex conjugate of the dielectric constant. Uh, there is this Onsaga relation that if we only go to negative spatial frequencies then the dielectric tensor becomes equal to its transverse. So the dielectric tensor at a negative spatial frequency is equal to the transverse and then uh, in the absence of a magnetic field the dielectric tensor must be symmetric because if we just set k equal to zero, then that means that epsilon of omega is equal to the uh, transverse. Uh, so that means that the dielectric tensor is a symmetric tensor. I showed you another proof of this uh, from the uh, energy density by taking the second derivative of the uh, energy density with respect to two different coordinates we can show that we can also show that the dielectric tensor must be symmetric. Um, when we fit uh, ellipsometry spectra then sometimes we find that uh, there are um, oscillators with a negative amplitude. Now we don't like that but that in itself is not always a problem but sometimes if we have a negative amplitude then uh, in, the, in our model, the, uh, the, neg the imaginary part of the dielectric function becomes negative. That should not happen. For a passive material, that means for a material which is not under high excitation, uh, there should be no optical gain and therefore the material can either be transparent, which means epsilon 2 is equal to zero, or the material is absorbed, or the, the, the light is absorbed, and that means that the uh, imaginary part of epsilon must be positive. And um, the last uh, analytical property of the dielectric function, um, so we've shown that uh, this, the dielectric function is well behaved as, uh, as a function in the complex plane. It is analytic and it does not have any essential uh, singularities. And uh, all complex functions that are well behaved uh, can be written as a quotient of two polynomials. So a complex function is defined by its zeros and poles in the complex plane. And given, uh, taken into account uh, these other uh, analytical properties of the dielectric function, we can write uh, the dielectric function as a product of uh, different terms where uh, in the uh, numerator we have the poles and in the denominator we have the I'm, so, I'm sorry, in the numerator we have the zeros and in the denominator we have the poles. Uh, 
So any dielectric function can be written like this. And uh, there is no physics behind this. This is simply math. And uh, we can apply this model. Now, this model is very similar to the Lorentz model, but we have an extra broadening parameter. If these two parameters are equal to each other, then each of these uh, product terms becomes equal to a sum in the uh, Lorentzian model. Uh, having this extra broadening parameter in the numerator um, gives us more flexibility because if we look, if we go back to our gallium phosphide picture, if we go back to our gallium phosphide picture, we can plot the uh, dielectric function that gives us the TO frequency and we can plot the loss function that gives us the uh, a peak for the longitudinal optical mode. In the Lorentz model, the broadening of the peak in the dielectric function is equal to the broadening of the peak in the loss function. That is an, that is an assumption which comes from our specific uh, damping model. Uh, we're assuming that the friction is proportional to the velocity and therefore these two uh, broadenings must be equal to zero. But um, that assumption is uh, not always valid and therefore for some materials we get a better agreement if we assume, if we allow two different broadenings for the longitudinal and the uh, transverse modes. Uh, in terms of the physics, we could say, well, the longitudinal mode has a higher frequency than the transverse mode, so at higher frequencies, things de typically decay faster because they can decay into other things. So we would expect that the longitudinal optical mode, because of its larger frequency, should have a larger broadening parameter than the TO mode. And looking at the dispersion relation, uh, the TO and the LO mode, uh, they will decay into different types of acoustic modes and again, depending on the uh, microscopic details of, this decay, the, of these decay processes, of these anharmonic decay processes, uh, that might explain why there should be different broadening parameters for the TO and the LO mode. So, um, this model here is, is purely mathematical. It was derived uh, f uh, in, in the 1970s. Uh, and um, that works very well for phonons and for plasmons in cases where the um, Lorentzian model will not work so well. So we have this uh, four parameters here where the four parameters are the longitudinal and transverse frequencies and the longitudinal and transverse uh, broadenings. So these two models are uh, the drude lorentz model and the, this, this four-parameter Lowndes model. Uh, they are identical if, I'm sorry, not the frequencies, uh, if the two broadenings are uh, equal. So I've come to my summary. Uh, with the Drude model, we can describe uh, the optical properties of solid, of metals, and we can also treat uh, semiconductors, doped semiconductors as metals with a very low um, carrier density. And I've shown you several examples today for doped semiconductors. I've shown, I've explained that the anisotropic uh, band valleys in uh, semiconductors can lead to complications uh, and also the multi-valley structure of uh, doped semiconductors. Uh, with the Lorentz model, we describe infrared lattice absorption and I've shown you a broad range of uh, examples for both simple cubic systems as well as for uh, complex, more complex crystal structures with many atoms and also for anisotropic materials. And I think
That was my last slide. Thank you very much. Yes. Of course. Uh, the previous slide, you explained, showed this four parameter model before it's the only model. Yes. And a few slides before, you also saw, uh, cited the Spurosawa paper, which is nine years older. Yes. Which also explains four parameter model. So, what is the difference between these? So, in this Kurosawa paper, I do not find any broadenings. So um, the way that everybody writes this equation like this, yeah. that's how the, the equation is usually written. This equation is not in Kurosawa. Uh, the first time that I have seen this equation is, is in Laundes. And there is another paper, uh, Berriman and Unterwald from 1968. And, um, they explain many of the things that go into this equation, but the, uh, this actual equation, I did not find it in, in Berryman and Unterwald. I find something similar, but I don't find that exact equation. So this equation I found for the first time in Laundes, and then if we look at papers by Gervais, uh, the French papers, then you know you see this equation all the time. But um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, why we, that's why we call it uh, uh, the Laundes model, because we believe that the first paper that we have found, um, the first paper that we have found where this equation is, uh, is written in this form uh, is by Laundes. But I think German is citing mostly Kurosawa only. So I don't know, maybe Berman. Yeah, Berman is the first. So um, Gervais, uh, Gervais is definitely later uh, than, uh, is, is after 1970. Other questions? Yes. I have a question uh, concerning uh, the Brunner uh, model in classical semiconductors, concerning not only this generation, but also uh, the question is that you have uh, frequency independent venting in this model. And uh, my question is how good is this model in uh, terahertz? So the question is about uh, the frequency dependence of the damping in the Drude model in doped semiconductors. And um, especially in the gigahertz and terahertz range. Uh, and I don't... I, the, the example that I have here is for indium arsenide, uh, but this is in the mid-infrared at 250 wave numbers. So here in the mid-infrared, a good fit to the experimental data, to the optical Hall effect experimental data, uh, is obtained with a uh, constant damping parameter of 50 wave numbers. Um, there are people who do terahertz ellipsometry measurements in a magnetic field. And I think there's, there's three groups that do this, one in Linköping in Sweden and one in Ma Ma Nebraska, Matthias Schubert, and one in uh, Toledo, um, Nick Podraza's group in Toledo. And um, from the papers that I have read from these three groups in, in terahertz uh, optical Hall effect, uh, they have one parameter which describes the damping. Um, but these measurements have not been very extensive. So there's, there's, there has not been a lot of work being done and it's only three groups. But um, from what I've seen from these three groups, uh, they have been using constant damping in the terahertz regime. So the question is, uh, how does the tamp damping def uh, depend on frequency? Um, I have not seen a lot of people talk about uh, that it does not agree. So, you know, like I said, the, the, the studies are rather limited.
Other questions? Yes. So the question is about uh, how do you define acoustic and optical uh, phonons in uh, crystals with a variable number of atoms. So if you, have an, if you have a crystal with only one atom per cell, then uh, that means that you have three degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom are a translation of the crystal, so you only have an acoustic mode. In a, in a crystal with only one atom, you can only have acoustic modes. You do not have any optical modes in crystals with, um, on, with only one atom per cell. That would be my, that would be my response. So uh, here the question says, well, in, in, a, in a BCC crystal, body center cubic crystal, I have a primitive cell and I have, which has only one atom, which allows only acoustic <coughs> modes. Um, but if I go to the a conventional cell, then I have more than one atoms where I should have, uh, where I should have optical modes. Now, typically, these arguments are not allowed by symmetry because when you make an argument in the primitive cell, then typically that same argument will also carry over. So you could, you, I don't think that this is going to work. I, I haven't tried it, but I don't think that this will work. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Um, and our next lecture will be in two weeks, right? On the 10th of May. And that will be, that's still the same length. It's not a shorter lecture. Okay, great. Thank you very much.